Greetings to everybody and welcome to the third episode of Nature Speaks. Nature Speaks is brought to you by Himalayan Nature and I'm him working for JSL in Kathmandu office. With me is Dr. Tulsi Subedi, co-host and director of Himalayan Nature. And as you know that this program is aimed at filling the gap on knowledge and connecting different generations of practitioners in their respective field, mostly the uh, conservation science. And so far we have heard from two wonderful people about their love to nature in the last two uh, Nature Speaks series. And this time we have the pleasure of listening from a very experienced and revered conservation guru of Nepal. I even call him the living conservation hero of Nepal. He is no other than Dr. Himant Raj Mishra. And let me just give a small introduction about his uh, past work and where he's affiliated currently. Dr. Misra is a member of the pioneering team that created the vast network of protected areas in Nepal. These protected areas are known to us by different names, as you know, national parks, wildlife reserve, conservation area, and hunting reserve. Dr. Misra worked in forestry department in Nepal and department of national parks and wildlife conservation for a number of years, including field deportation. So he was in the field for some period of time. Besides the government, Dr. Mishra has also worked for many renowned institutions, to name few, the National Trust for Nature Conservation, which was at that time known as King Mahendra Trust for Nature Conservation, the World Bank, the Global Environment Facility, and the Asian Development Bank. In addition, he has also served as international advisor for various international NGOs, such as the World Wildlife Fund, WWF, the American Himalayan Foundation, and the Human Humane Society International. Dr. Misha has a PhD in forestry and natural resource management from the University of Edinburgh, UK, and several publications to his credit. They also include some popular books, The Soul of the Rhino, The Bones of the Tiger, and Nepal's Royal Sito National Park, a handbook, a few uh, to mention. And these English versions of the book, some of them were so popular that there was a high demand for a Nepali translation and the soul of the rhino has been translated into Gairaku Atma and it's already in the market. Dr. Mishra is also a recipient of the prestigious J. Paul Getty Award for Conservation Leadership, which is a very, um, I think he's the only Nepali who has got this um, um, important award. Uh, in 1987, I think, if I correctly remember. Currently, he serves as a global ambassador for Wellbeing International. It's a human animal welfare organization based in the United States of America. So, Dr. Misra, welcome to this program. Uh, before I give you the floor, I will just uh, announce some housekeeping rules. rules. I just wanted to let everybody know that this session is being recorded and also live stream via Facebook. Regarding the presentation, if you, if you like any questions, it's to the audience. If you like any questions to Dr. Mishra, please do so through the chat options available just before the presentation is finished. And please direct those questions to me. And I'll try to read them for Dr. Mishra. And as you know that we have limited time, we may be able to answer only a few. And we hope you understand that limited time frame that is with us. Now to Dr. Mishra. Dr. Mishra, the floor is yours. I like to especially thank uh, my dear friend Dr. Himbaral for inviting me to make this presentation today. Most of you know that Himji ranks among the top of Nepal's scientists in conservation biology, particularly in ornithology. He is also a practical and a pragmatic person with talents to get things done in his own quiet and gentle ways. I know him when he was a little baby, shall I say, <laughs> when he was a young man. Indeed, I think he is the real Prakriti Pujari. I'd also like to thank Dr. Tulsi Subedi of Himalayan Nature for his help in setting this long distance presentation. I am terrible when it comes to technology, but him. Baba Tulsi was, was just great. 
And Kulsiji, I'm told, is also one of those young scientists who knows how to convert good science into good conservation. And thank you. Let me get on now. Dr. Baral had told me to start the presentation with some of my anecdotal experiences. Thus, may I start by three words of wisdom or points of wisdom which was taught to me by my teachers and elders. First, conservation without any funding is only conversation, as the great Swaminathan, the former president of the World Conservation Union, once told me of all the places in Costa Rica. Second, good ecology is always good economics. This is a quote from Raymond Dasman, who wrote Ecological Principles for Economic Development, a, a book a book he wrote way in the 70s, long before these days. Third is, I don't know who said this, but I like it. Hard work, network, and above all, teamwork are primary pathways to success in conservation. Indeed, like war and peace and, the, and, a, and a winning game of football, saving wildlife and their habitat is a team event. No single person can do it by himself alone. Many of the things I will be saying today may not be new, but all hat to most of you, as you have been there and done it before yourself. The photos I am using are very beautiful, but not mine, mostly from various copyright sources, including from my dear friend Masahiro Izima. Some of the facts and figures quoted here are based on secondary sources. Thus, if I, have, if I have made mistakes or anything, I'm ready to stand corrected. Nevertheless, the roadmap of this presentation has three parts. First, I'll provide you with an overview of Nepal's cultural and natural heritage. Second, I'll present a case study on five decades of Nepalese experience in wildlife and nature conservation. Third, I give you some of my own views on future conservation in Nepal in the 21st century and the fate of wild flora and fauna in Nepal. Mostly I will be using the iconic species, the great 100 rhinoceros to exemplify my key points. Most of you know that Nepal is a small rectangular country sandwiched between two largest and competing antagonistic giants or superpowers of Asia, India and China. Compared to the rest of the world, Nepal ranks 93rd in area and 49th by population from all countries listed in the United Nations, I think. Most of you know that at, with his, within a short span of only 120 miles, Nepal displays an unique ecological spectrum, perhaps unmatched elsewhere on Earth. The area of Nepal is about 57,000 square miles, and the population is almost going to be about uh, 30 million. And 80% of the, you, you all know this, but I have already written it. So 80% of the month of the country is mountainous and hilly, and 20% lies in the lowland terrain where most of the big megafaunas of Nepal live. Of course, you know the highest point uh, is uh, Mount Everest National Park at 29,000 in Sagamata National Park. And the lowest point, uh, I just read it the other day, is somewhere in Japa, in a place I've never been before. And 90 of the world's tallest mountains over, near or over 23,000 feet are in Nepal. That's why we get this diverse ecological spectrum. Nepal's culture is equally diverse. It is largely dominated by two of the world's oldest religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, and for some, tourism. 
because of its geographical location, Nepal has nature has enriched Nepal with flora and fauna, which bridges two of the world's largest ecoregions, the Palearctic regions of China and Eurasia in the north, and the Indo-Malayan realm of South and Southeast Asia. Mammalian species of the north include the Himalayan thar, which to my mind is the monarch of the mountain. And this elusive snow leopard, the prime predator of the Himalayas. Prey species in the Himalayas include this musk deer. The largest predator of the Indo-Malayan realm include the almighty tiger, the king of Nepal's tropical parai. And as its name implies, the common leopard is also common both in the Tarai and the mountains. Nepal is home to two species of bears, the sloth bear of the tropical Tarai and its cousin, the Himalayan black bear of the temperate mountains. Five species of deer in the lowlands include the chital, which to my mind is the prettiest of all the deer of the world. And the sambar, which is the largest deer among the Asia, Asian deer. And in addition, one of my favorite animals, the swamp deer of Suklapanta National Park in far west Nepal. Antelope species include this blue bull, which were once common throughout the Tarai, but now their numbers are declining fast. The black buck, which are almost extinct, but the Department of National Parks and Wildlife Conservation had been successful to bring it back from the brink of extinction, largely through their Krishnasar conservation area in Bardia district. Wild buffalo include the Asiatic wild, I mean, Wild cattle include the Asiatic wild buffalo or Arna of Koshi Tapu Wildlife Reserve and this gaur from Chiton National Park. As you know, both of these bovids are ancestors of modern day domestic cattle and buffaloes. Small herds of Asian wild elephant also roam throughout the Tarai. The common langur and the resource monkeys are commonly seen all over Nepal. The marsh magar and this fish-eating gharial are two species that represent the crocodile family in Nepal. I hope you all watched P.B. Griffith's excellent presentation on the gharials last week. I learned such a lot from that. Little is known about lesser creatures such as frogs and toads and the bees and the butterflies, yet they are the key indicators of environmental health and impacts from climate change. Nepal is known as a bird watcher's paradise with almost 900 species, including this elegant daughter from the tropical Tarai. I am told that Nepal represents 8% of the birds of the world. MG, correct me if I am wrong. And they also okay. include this. Absolutely right. And they also include this colorful dafe, Nepal's national bird. With an estimated 6,400 flowering plants, species including these rhododendron, the country's national flower, indeed Nepal is a botanist dreamland. To protect the country's outstanding flora and fauna, Nepal has created 20 protected areas which cover more than 13,000 square miles or 20% of its land area, including their buffer zone. I apologize because this map needs to be updating. At this point, I will move to the second part to present a case study on the past five decades of Nepalese experience in wildlife conservation, particularly in reference to Chiton and the Rhino. The history of wildlife conservation perhaps dates back to 1846, when Jangabadur, the first Rana Prime Minister, declared the, Rana, declared the uh, rhino as the royal animal. 
plus rhinos and its habitat were strictly preserved as royal hunting preserves. But as huntings were infrequent and habitats were well protected, the rhino numbers remained stable between 800 to 1,000 in the first half of the 20th century. With the support from the United States, the government of Nepal eradicated malaria and settled a large number of people from the mountains in the Tarai, including in Chiton. Consequently, more than 80% of the rhino land were converted into human settlement by the mid-1960s. Human population soared from a handful to hundreds of thousands. Poaching and habitat destructions became rampant and the rhino population plummeted. In 1968, I was fortunate to count rhinos with Dr. Graham Cawley. He was the, the world's top expert on population dynamics of large wild mammals. This count was the first comprehensive and scientific census of rhinos in Chiton. We did count it by, by, both by helicopters and by elephants in the ground. The census findings were alarming indeed. First, it showed that there were no more than a maximum of 110 rhinos left in Nepal. Second, the ratio of n cast to adults were less than 5% of the population. Most of you know that this low dense numbers of uh, n calves is an indicator of a rapidly declining population. Dr. Kahle also predicted that rhino will be extinct from Nepal by 1980s if the current then present trend of uh, then trend of uh, poaching and habitat destructions continued. Dr. Kahle's uh, report also had a sobering impact on King Mahendra, Nepal's absolute and all-powerful ruler at that time. He directed his government to take immediate and comprehensive actions. These included to seek United Nations technical assistance to formulate new policy, legal, and administrative instruments to create a network of protected areas through Nepal. He also directed his government to create Nepal's first national park in Chiton using the standards prescribed by the World Conservation Union. And he also put a great emphasis on training and capacity development of, of Nepalese in wildlife conservation. However, King Mahendra didn't leave enough to see the fruits of his directors. Nevertheless, his Harvard-educated son, Birendra, followed his father's footsteps. He promulgated a first-of-his-kind comprehensive National Parks and Wildlife Conservation Act in Nepal in 1972. He, he also partnered with international organizations such as FAO, of the United Nations, WWF, Smithsonian, IUCN, and others. And Nepal created its first national park in 1973. It was exactly 101 years after the first, world's first national park was created by the Americans in Yellowstone in 1872. Moreover, King Birendra also deployed the Royal Nepalese Army to combat poaching and habitat destructions in protected areas. I think recognizing that political will is vital for conservation, he also galvanized much needed political will. He created a Royal Palace Wildlife Conservation Committee, a powerful and handsome body. He assigned his own brother, Prince Ganendra, as the chairman of this inclusive committee. The committee uh, members included the Minister and Secretary of Forest, the Director General of the Department of National Parks and Wildlife Conservation, senior officials of the Forest Department and the Royal Palace. This action-oriented watchdog took firm and innovative actions. These included getting national parks and wildlife conservation listed in priority of the national development plans. Committee also ensured budget and staff were in place and on time. Again, there was a great emphasis on human resource development and their capacity to do the work in Nepal by the Nepalese. The committee was also successful 
in obtaining international support, largely through its network. The committee was also act activated, uh, was active and activated the community participation in conservation. They also promoted sustainable wildlife tourism, prioritizing benefits to the local people. The creation of National Park, Chitral National Park, primary to save rhinos proved to be a successful pilot pro endeavor. It was also a harbinger to what many historians call the golden years of nature and wildlife conservation in Nepal. Of the 20 protected areas in Nepal today, all but one national parks and three conservation areas were created between 1973 and 1995. Sagarmatha, Mount Everest National Park, the world's highest protected area was created as a gift to the global conservation community at a special request by Prince Bernard of the Netherlands, president of the World Wildlife Fund on behalf of the global conservation community. Poaching and habitat destructions were controlled and the rhino population peaked to over 500 for the first time. In addition, Nepal's daring and pioneering program of finding new homes to chicken rhinos in Bardia proved to be successful. However, while most of us were blowing our own trumpets and gloating on our successes during the golden years, a bloody revolution was brewing under the shadows of the Himalayas, launching Nepal into a decade of destruction. The fate of not only the rhinos, but other species were at best uncertain. Chiton and other protected areas in the country became a hotspot of the Maoist revolution against monarchy. Park premises looted and some of the park staff were killed. Poaching and habitat uh, destruction again became pandemic. 15,000 people perished before wisdom finally prevailed. The civil war ended in 2006 and a peace agreement was forced. The king was forced to surrender all his powers. 240-year-old monarchy was abolished in 2008, and finally, Nepal was declared as a federal democratic republic. The end of, uh, mon the end of monarchy caused armchair pundits to predict a doom and gloom scenario. We do have many pundits in Nepal, I think more than here in the United States. They rationalized that the underpinning force behind wildlife conservation was the king who was dethroned through a, through a violent revolution. They also said that any program championed by the king or the royals, no matter how successful, or distasteful to the rulers of the new Nepal. <clears throat> let, let me drink a little water. Their gloom and doom hypothesis mostly stemmed from a few untested assumptions. These assumptions included that protected areas and wildlife conservation are at the bottom of the priority list of the national development plans of the winners of the revolution. National parks and wildlife conservation, they said, were Western and elitist con concept unfit in post revolution Nepal, where economic development and poverty eradication were the highest priorities. They also said that the clarion calls were such like they say people first and not wildlife animals were frequently echoed. I mean, we had heard that before also. If time proved that the pontification of the pundits of doom and gloom proved to be absolutely wrong. Critical areas such as Chiton National Park and wildlife reserves were more resilient than they had anticipated. With the end of civil war and restoration of peace, protected areas, including Chiton, rejuvenated fast. Like the phoenix, the mythical quick bird 
the rhinos and other species rise from the ashes of Nepal's brutal civil war. Wildlife numbers, particularly of endangered species like the tiger, bounced back. Tourism rebound, rebounded, bringing back the jobs and livelihood, livelihood to the local people. Perhaps the biggest achievement was the rhino numbers soared to over 600. The key question some of the members of the global conservation community often ask is, what made it work? How did endangered species prized by poachers survive the ruthless decade of destruction? How did Nepal do it? I'll try to answer these questions with five key points. First, Nepal's national parks and wildlife conservation programs were built on a solid foundation with implementable legal and administrative structure. Second, the staff in the field were well-trained, brave, and showed courage and competency during the time of the crisis. This includes many of the NGOs who were working in Chiton, in Barbia, and places like that. Local community, community solidly backed the park authorities despite political differences. And you may ask, why did they do that? I think because the program to share benefits, particularly tourism dollars from conservation with the local people were fair and transparent, and they were also practical and pragmatic. Moreover, a well-disciplined unit of Nepal army were in place to combat poaching and habitat destruction. At this point, I will shift to the last part of my presentation and express some of my own thoughts on lesson learned and future of conservation in Nepal in the 21st century. Seasoned leaders of the conservation movement have often voiced, not, not in the thing, but for, even from the last century, they have often voiced that creating and sustaining protected areas and saving endangered species is not only science, like physics and mathematics, but like politics, it is an art, the art of the possible. But the art of the possible is only possible if actions are politically palatable at the national level, at local level, and also at international level these days. They have to be cultural and accepted by the general society or tolerable. They have, there has to be local benefits built in, such as jobs, income, and ecological services, such as clean water, clean air, and prevention of land destruction. Actions have to be backed by good data based on good science. I think you will all agree to that. And projects and programs implemented has to be not only ecologically, but economically sustainable. After all, ecology and economics are two sides of the same coin, and sustainability is the rim that binds them together. Indeed, the recipe of success that I have just outlined is a tall order, particularly for a rugged and impoverished country like Nepal, where the problems are complex and the solutions seldom obvious. Nevertheless, one question I often ask these days is, what is the fate and future of conservation and endangered species in Nepal in this first half of the 21st century? I am programmed to be an optimistic decades ago when I had much, much, much younger. Moreover, one must be, must be optimistic to be a professional conservation biologist. Otherwise, it won't work. Thus, based at looking numbers and the status of wildlife and their habitat in national parks and protected areas in today's Nepal, I can say that I feel optimistic. The future looks not bad, but good. However, a few Nepal watchers and scholars, both inside and outside the country, challenge my optimism. They claim they claim that Nepal today is still a country lost in transition.
still trying to find his soul as it moves on from mon monarchism to Maoism and beyond, but has no sense of direction. Moreover, Nepal watchers say that nature and wildlife conservation is not on the top of their priority list of the new rulers of Nepal. And it doesn't mean much to them. Examples the Nepal watchers often cite are some of the controversial port projects which have been in news, not only in Nepal, but well. First, they proposed railway lines and highways through Chiton National Park. And may, many of you know, are known, you know, Chiton was one of the first World Heritage Site nominate among the first, not the, but among the first World Heritage Site selected by the international conservation community, particularly IUCN and UNESCO. Second, the proposed Nishkar Airport that destroyed the last remaining forest and biodiversity of Nepal's unique Sarposis Dadi. I am told, and I have also read, that the cost of the project is between 10 billion to 12 billion dollars. And even economists, top economics, both in the development banks, such as World World Bank and the Asian Development Bank, say that the airport does not make sense. Anyway, and the third point they also point out is sand and gravel mining, mostly to export to India. You know, some, you know, some of the examples they say, right, you know, why conservation is not on the priority list. However, I am a mere mortal. I cannot judge. I cannot see future or predict the future. You know, I'm just a human being. Only Samai, I'm Samai Banchani, the god of time. I don't know what it is. I don't know whether it's possible or or whatever it is. Only the god of time can predict with absolute certainty. While I cannot predict the future, I can say with absolute certainty that political will is paramount to sustain Nepal's successes in nature conservation achieved in the last 50 years. These successes were achieved by blood, sweat, and tears of Nepalese, both in the government, non-government sector, and the private sector, particularly tourism. They made a lot, they made a lot, they made a lot of sacrifice. Plus, in addition, to the support and goodwill of the global conservation community. Well, thank you very much. That you are. I have nothing to say. Thank you, Dr. Sab. If you can um, now uh, stop sharing your screen, then um, we can uh, proceed. How do I do that? Um, it should be towards the top. Uh, Tulsi, can you direct? Uh, Daksha, should be towards the top. If you just uh, just, just, just click, click the screen off. Okay. Ah, no, still there. Okay. Okay, that's uh, that's fantastic, Daksha. Thank ah, you okay, so good, much. Good. Thank, thank you so much for uh, such a lovely presentation and. Um, um, Honestly, telling I don't know how much uh, I think everybody will join me uh, to say that they have learned quite a big deal, you know, today uh, from your presentation. And uh, if you allow me, uh, then I will, as I said before, I will start taking the questions um, from the participants. So um, let me just see. Um, which is the first question. And uh, if you want to ask anything to Dr. Misra, please do um, write down your questions through the chat options available. And I'll try to pick them up. Okay, which is the first question. Okay, the first question is from Professor Karan Saha. I hope you remember the name, Dr. Oh. Misra. Of course, the snow leopard. The first one to study the snow leopard. 
Yes, absolutely. Yes. And his question is uh, not about Snow Leopard. His question is about, do you have a role model who had inspired you in your field? Ah, That's his question. Yes, I, 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 I have many role models. One, I showed you the picture of Sir Peter Scott holding the crocodile, a nice, humble gentleman despite that his father was the first one to go to the South Pole. He's an Olympic gold medalist. He was the founder who designed the thing. You know, I, you know, I, I, I have that. I have many, I have a few role models in Nepal, including some of the people who were there uh, in the past. And these are not very people with names known like Prembadur Rai who was our head sikari, like Subbaram Lotan, Babu Tharu, you know, there are many, and even at the present day, I call him the living, the living Mr. Rampriti Adab. Yes, I have many, many role models here, and many mentors, including also Prabhakar Rana, the late Prabhakar Rana. Yes. Thank you, Dr. We seem to have quite a lot, and yes. I think... Uh, uh, some of some our friends in the audience and uh, myself, we did meet some of you, um, uh, some of those people who inspired you to be in this field. Thank you, Dr. Sap. The next question is from Ramesh Chaudhary, a very well-known field ornithologist, uh, actively engaged in bird conservation. Uh, he's from Sauraha and he's asking, it seems like animal-human conflict is rising these days more than before, how can this issue be mitigated? I think, Chaudhary you have pointed out the most serious problem I can see in the 21st century. I see two things. One is the human-animal conflict. If we cannot resolve the human-animal conflict, what we did in the last 50 years might not be sustainable. The second thing is I'm also worried after I saw this slide of the death of the Segas in uh, Kazakhstan and the disease epidemic. I mean, we are concentrated on conservation. I think that there is so, so much little research, research done. I think I agree. I think the challenge now for my brothers, sisters, or Sarachari, whatever you might call them, in Nepal is to resolve the animal, wildlife, and particularly when it comes to tigers and elephants. I agree. And I, I mean, I have read it. That's what I, I'm, I'm trying to think, but I don't know the, I don't know how to go about it yet. Thank you, Dr. Um, it's, I think it's quite a complex issue, human wildlife conflict. And I think that will uh, require another, maybe another, we will invite somebody on the human wildlife conflict um, uh, issue later. The next question is from another well-known uh, person, Carol Inskip, uh, who you might know, of course. Of course, of course, Carol. Of course, yes. And uh, she's saying, um, thank you very much for your excellent and encouraging talk on conservation in Nepal. It is so good to hear you are optimistic about the future. What makes you feel optimistic in the face of the many development challenges facing Nepal today. If you could uh, be brief in answering this, then I can take more questions. Thank you, all, Carol, it's so nice to hear from you. After all, after all you are, you and Tim and many others were the one who put birds on the map of Nepal, or Nepal on the map of the world to birds. The reasons for, I don't know, but uh, Perhaps that's the way that's the way I am because if you are an optimistic, you don't give up. And I don't like giving up. And the reason I also feel optimistic is uh, I mean we have fought many battles on conservation. You have done so yourself. We have won many more battles, but the war still goes on. And uh, you have to be uh, optimistic to keep on fighting. I don't know. I really don't know how to answer this very difficult question. But I am born to be an optimistic, I think. 
I know. I think Carol is also optimistic, but I, th I thought <laughs> she, was, she was just trying to some of your skills to be even more optimistic, I think. Anyway, thank you for answering that, uh, Dr. Mishra. The next question is again from somebody you know very well, our friend Marcus Cotton. Uh, his question is, how can tourism be harnessed even better to serve the conservation in Nepal? Hi, Marcus. Of course, Marcus knows because he was my also partner in crime in, when he was working for us in the trust. He said, he said, and, Namaste to you. Ah, yes, I saw him. I saw that. I saw Namaste also, Marcus. And Marcus is like a brother. He is also a family, you know, to me and Susma. I, well, I think the problem with the tourism uh, in Nepal, I think it it needs to be. It needs to be revisited, uh, particularly in the context of Chiton, because some of the tourism operators are complaining that too many people, too many cars in the park. You cannot take an elephant, but why are you uh, allowing? So basically, the tourism at the, at the, in, in the context of Nepal does, because in many ways, tourism, whether it was high paying tourists or low, low, low paying tourists, but it was one of the catalysts. When, when we were there in Chiton, they were working in Chiton, there were people who said we wanted to throw us out, beat us, ask, ask Mr. Opreti the problem and the thing we went through. But now when I am in Chiton, even the tourist organization of Saura, about two years ago, gave me an award for tourism. I said, what did I do? But it is a time that we need to revisit uh, revisit thing. Marcus, uh, that's a thing. I am not sure whether I have the answer. I can answer your, your question directly. You probably know the answer yourself since you have been there, done it. But uh, one thing I think the government and the NGOs really have to look at, I think two or three issues, critical issues. One is the conflict that's already you pointed out. Uh, the conflict issues, one, as I said, about the issues of disease. And the third is the, is the thing because we shouldn't kill the goose that lays the golden egg. That is that you know that is that is that that is very critical. You know we can't we can't we can't, we can't in Japan, you know. Thank you, Dr. Um, uh, there is another question from Abdul Sahim Ansari. But I don't know whether you can answer that or not. He says, "Can we revise buffer zone?" policies in context of human wildlife conflict in Tarai project area since since one size policy is not fitting all. Let us make buffer zone more people centered to save wildlife on longer run. I think uh, Namaskar. I don't know. I don't know how you do it because I'm neither I'm neither in the government nor I work for any international India and how you do it, I think I cannot answer that. But but you but you have a point there yeah, that it has to be you know you know some of the things have to be really have has to be re revisited in the context of what the issues and the problems are and I don't know what they are currently. You know. Thank you, Dr. Uh, another question is from Clay Mueller. I hope I pronounce it right. Thank you very much for your presentation. It has been informative and inspiring. My question is, which area or ecoregions of Nepal do you feel are least represented conservation-wise? Thank you. If you, if, if you look at, just looking at the, just looking at the mountain, I still feel that the mid uh, mountain or the mid hills are, are least uh, represented. Uh, well, of course, there, 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 for that, uh, there are reasons for that because it's, it's, it's densely populated. But that, you know, that, that is the, the middle, the mid mountain regions of Nepal is the least uh, represented. That's what I feel, you know. Thank you, Dr. Um, the Another question is uh, from our very young scientist, emerging scientist, Yadav Ghimire. Um, um, I think listening, um, oh, sorry. Will you mind citing an instance of how you and your team convinced uninterested politicians to accept your logic and demand of conservation? I think listening this will motivate a lot of us, as you said, 
political will is paramount for conservation. Well, I, I don't know that's a very good question and it's a very difficult question to answer. But one thing is, right now I see that I have been in Chiton when, not this prime minister, but one of the, one of the prime ministers was there. He was about maybe five minutes from the park, but he didn't go to the park. He is to figure out how do you take them there. Him, maybe his security and the guard, but not with a fleet. And when they see it, when they visit it, when they see it, they, are, they don't get any harassment from the media or from the other politicians. And that is the problem. First of all, they have to, they have to be there and see it, how rich. It might, Nepal might be a poor country, but when it comes to nature and wildlife, you know, I, think, I think we are among the richest in the world. But they just don't go. You know, I haven't, I, I, you know, I haven't seen except one, two prime ministers, as I know of, since the, uh, in the last 15 years, I haven't seen any, uh, God knows how many prime ministers we have had, I think we have 10 or 15. Uh, I haven't seen, so, you know, figure it out, how you can take them, how you can convince them, you know. Basically, you need to market uh, conservation to the politician. That's the, I don't I don't know I really don't know how to, I don't know how to answer I, this. I think uh, Dr. Sab, you will probably be you, you will need to be in touch with uh, our young scientist Yadav because you <laughs> used to work with the kings and they still have you know not let the not let the you know common touch you know you still had the touch of the people like you mentioned as your inspirer all the you know uh, subas from the elephant stable and those kind of people. So maybe Yadav, you can be in touch with Dr. Mishra and yes. I'm sure, you know, he will teach you, um, you know, in, in his better time, you know, when he has more time. Well, uh, the, the, the thing is, can I add one? The thing is that when you are in the business of conservation, you have to have an antennas all the time. There is no one single, one quick side. You have to listen, you have to find out what would interest. Absolutely. You know, and, and, and then try to figure out a way. I don't know. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Sap. That's, uh, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, we have another question from Dr. Sarala Khaling. She lives in uh, West Bengal, Sikkim area. And she has lived in Nepal for some time, working for WWF, a very reputed uh, conservation organization here. She has a long question. So it, it, she has written a bit long one. So please listen carefully. Since protected area systems in Nepal are well known internationally for the benefit sharing mechanisms, they have especially compared to the conservation systems, conservative systems in the protected area regimes in India. This has been possible due to tourism revenues. However, post COVID-19 in the new normal, when tourism sector will be impacted, how do you think this impact, this will impact this benefit sharing mechanism the PAs are so well known for? You'll have to give well, a short answer. First, Salaji, I think I have met you at the WWF and didn't you train my son when he did a thing at the, at the intern at the WWF. And that's, I think if I'm, if I'm talking about the same Salaji, the, to answer your question, this COVID thing is tourism, not only in Nepal, everywhere in the world, including the United, including the United States. Nobody knows how many hotels, big, big hotels, how many airlines is going to go belly up. They opened the thing because of for economic reason. They opened Florida. I don't know whether you have uh, raised the news and the COVID has increased uh, drastically in the last week. So this is a new challenge. I don't know how you can deal with it. And it is certainly, it is certainly going to impact. Uh, it is certainly going to impact tourism, but more than tourism, I think one of the reasons poaching has been down, not only in Nepal, but also in India is because of tourism, because you know, the tourists are also in many ways eyes and ears. 
they see, they hear, and the people who run tourist packet facilities are also eyes and ears for conservation, not they are our unpaid guys. So I am, I am not son, but I was somebody raised that question uh, to me the other day. Has poaching increased or any news of poaching because of their lack of tourism? I don't know, Salaji, really, really, the, but, but I appreciate your question. You know, the, you know there, could, there could be other consequences which we do not know. Thank you, Dr. Sab. I think uh, what uh, Dr. Sarla Khaling asked is a quite a, you know, important question, I think, and this is been being debated uh, throughout among the conservation organizations and among the tourism sectors also. I think it's, so, a, very, it's a very, very serious question. Yes, very, it is. Very yeah. Dr. Sab, we will take another question now. Uh, uh, the next person asking is Chandra Thapa. Um, um, if I'm right, he worked for Tiger Tufts, he worked for NTNC, uh, and he's also, you know, both conservation and tourism hats he wears. Thank you, Dr. Saab, for the excellent presentation. Do you foresee the government reconsidering hotels to operate inside the National Park? I, 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 I really, I really don't, I really, I really do not know, I really do not know, perhaps, you know, because I, I'm, 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 I think he's talking in the context of Nepal. I really, I really don't know. I, mean, I, 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 I just don't know what the government uh, does and doesn't do. I have no access, you know. Yes, um, I think uh, we'll uh, definitely be, you know, talking about that and uh, maybe asking that question to some government authority, you know, in our next, um, you know, um, episode. Uh, the next question is Akansha Sresta um, asking a question. And she says, uh, conservation without any funding is only conversation. That's what you showed you in your slide. With the decline in the current economic condition because of the COVID-19 pandemic, how do you think this will affect conservation? I think I think <laughs> I don't know again the answer how, but I can say that it will affect because the fighting the war against the pandemic is uh, is quite costly. It's not only the unemployment here now. And I think the latest figure here in the United States is that 40 million people are unemployed because of this. So and so the government has to shift the priorities of the budget. It will also impact. It will also impact uh, the non-governmental sector uh, thing because when people don't have business or uh, you know money, they don't. So I I don't know how, but it but it will. Thank you, Dr. Sab. Next question is from Babu Krishna Karki. He uh, is a retired brigadier general of Nepal Army and uh, very well known in the conservation community. Your presentation was great learning for us. Thank you and we are grateful. May I request your key message to Nepal, how to maintain the success and achievements that we had in the past? How to maintain? Well, keep repeating. If you are, if you are doing it good, keep repeating the success, you know, I, you know why the success uh, is... Uh, well, as I, as I said at the last slide, it's all, it is also... It's also like 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 anything in the world. It's also, you know, getting the generating the political generating the political will. Uh, how do you, how do how do you how do you do that? And to generate political will, you have to start at both ends. You have to go from top to bottom and from bottom to top. I think. Uh, I, 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 I I think I think that's uh, the thing. You know, these are, I mean, these, these are very good, these are very good questions, but I'm not sure that I can answer. Okay. I, th I think you're trying your level best. Uh, it's very good. Thank you, Dr. Sap. The next question is uh, it's from a um, young university graduate, Nishan Baral. Could you, namaste, sir. Could you point out your opinion on domestication of elephant and human wildlife slash elephant conflict and maybe the role of the elephant breeding center in Chitwan Amit? 
Well, that there are three questions in that one. Three First questions. of all, the elephant-human conflict I was talking mainly from the wild elephants. As you know, Marcus knows that sometime back ago, I had to deal with a rogue, uh, rogue elephant in Zappa. And I, while I was trying to catch it, that it catch it and maybe I thought I'll tame it. But for some reason, when I darted it, I killed it. I overdosed it or, or something happened. So that I was talking in that context of uh, that. And the question of domestic elephants, I don't know what is the question, but elephants have been domesticated. In fact, I am researching on my book on domestication of elephants before even Christ was born. So there are various things, the, the whole transition of uh, domestication of elephant is not, it's not only time they were used in war, Mount Battle used it in Burma. I mean, there, there are, and of course, of course, of course for, for tourism, in, for tourism in Nepal, it's, it, it, it has been one of the, one of the items, you know, people come, like the slide I saw of my friend, Jim, it, the childhood comes on him when he sees the elephant, particularly when, he's, he, when he takes a bath with the elephant. Uh, and what was the third, third question? On the elephant breeding center, I really, you know, I have been a laureate for uh, 21st century laureate for almost 30 years. So I really do not know how you, how you do things or get things done these days. So I, 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 I really do not know, but it, it, it has a, it, it, it has a potential. After all, when you go to Chiton, I always go to the little thing and you see, a, you see a lot of, lot of people. You know, elephant generates a hell of a lot of interest, not only among the children, but also with grown up people. I hope I answered your question. If not, please send me an email, you know. Thank you, Dr. Sir. Other than the questions, I don't know whether you can see these questions or not. You know, there are several people who have known you, who worked with you, uh, including Tob Khatri sir and others, Narendra Pradhan, Fadindra Kharel, who was the uh, Director General of the National Park. They have uh, said hello to you and namaste to you. There is uh, one more question I will take and then I think we'll have to end. And that, I actually, I say one more question, but um, the questions from one person, and that is Ashok Ram. He's a young uh, man, um, uh, assist the, Assistant Conservation Officer, whatever, in Parsa National Park. I don't like that first assistant. He's a conservation in conservation officer in Parsa National Park. Yes. And he's doing a PhD on elephants. So he's saying he has a set of questions. Uh, so just uh, listen carefully. Sir, namaste. I want to know about the elephant status of early days. My question is, one, what is the elephant population? What was the elephant population in Nepal in early days? So you can just give a kind of numeric figure there. B, were elephants migrating east-west in early days? And third question is, are any groups of domestic elephants released in Chitwan Parsa complex by the government of Nepal? Okay, I will answer the, from the last question. No domestic elephants were released in Parsa uh, to 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 dewild them, to to dewild them, or uh, to to, to dewild them. I don't know. I don't think so. I have. So he's saying one. Parsa Chitwan complex, not only Parsa, but Parsa Chitwan complex. Parsa Parsa Parsa, Parsa, Parsa Chitwan. One or two elephants. One or two elephants have escaped from the Hatisar and gone and make it with wild elephants and have come back. That has happened, and that has been happening historically. But they haven't been. None of the domestic elephants have been uh, divided. Now, the first question is is a very interesting. When, as you know, when I was working in Chitwan and, and in and in Saura, we never uh, saw wild elephants in Saura. Most of the wild elephants used to be at Bankata or Tiger Pass area or that, but. For the last 10 years or, or, or even more than 10 years, we saw that the elephant population is increasing. That's, that's what, that's, that, 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 that is uh, what I can say. The, in those days, the only elephants 
you know, more than five or six in a group I have seen, it was in Bardia and in Salavanda. And of course, the, 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 the herd that migrates uh, from India to, uh, to Nepal and across was, was in that part. So, but I can't give you the exact numbers because we, we have some things. I'm sorry, what was the second question? Oh. What the uh, second question, Bishi Mahi. I will just uh, check. Yeah, no, I think, you know, it was, my, it was migration, it was the migration. Of course, of course, elephant, elephants migrate. In, elephant you know. population in early days, elephants migrating east-west in early days. Were they migrating yeah. east-west early days? Well, they, 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 they migrate, they migrate east-west because that's where the Sarkozy Valley goes, east-west. And then on, on a little wise, they, you can say that they migrate north-south also, but the elephants, I have seen in Persa way back is when I was again the assistant DFO, okay, in Birgans way back in 1967 when I have seen it was in Rambori, Vata and Tori. So obviously these elephants are coming, crossing the Chures and coming into Saura. Or they could be coming through the Madi Valley through the Bantaka Road. Thank you so much. As I was asking, and I said last question, there was another question popping up by Som GC. He's asking, are the tools and technology used, you know, these days, are they sufficient for conservation? Are they appropriate for conservation? So I think you can give a, a short answer to that. Well, they are, they are certainly better than the uh, tools and equipment we had. For example, the if you look at the radio colors we are using, they are antique. Now you can put a radio color in a bird or a tiger or a rhino in Nepal and, and monitor it even from here. So the two, you know, two tools are two, 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 you know, tools are there, and also the camera traps, uh, which you know, I think uh, didn't exist in our days. So, so, so they are they are better. But tools and things will not, will not only solve the problem, they are the tools to be used to resolve the issues. Thank you, Dr. Saab. I think uh, we, uh, we need to close the session now. Do you have any final thing to say very briefly to audience? Otherwise, I will just read the last uh, closing kind of a statement. I just have to say hi to Tok. He and two others. <laughs> and rather are my three pillars. I told uh, my three pillars of the work, I and mean, the one of the best and the, you know, not one, of, one of the most talented people I have, I have worked. And without them, I have been nowhere. Thank you, Dr. Saab. Um, so now I'm going to close with this small statement I will read. So on behalf of the organizers and audience, we'd like to thank Dr. Mishra for sparing your precious time to share your knowledge five decades of experience with us. Nobody, you know, I mean, very few people in this country are here living uh, who can share with uh, us with this uh, vast amount of knowledge. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mishra. We are grateful to you. Your presentation has been very informative and full with uh, new knowledge. Uh, for example, the helicopter survey of rhinos in Chitwan National Park, I had not known that before. I'm sure some uh, audience probably know it, but uh, many did not know about it. And um, very many thanks to the audience for joining with us in this presentation. Those of you who join us a bit late, please be reminded that the entire presentation will be available on Himalayan Nature's YouTube site, so you can uh, watch it full. We'll be back with another presentation within a week, so please um, um, follow Himalayan Nature's page to find out what's coming next. next. We'll have another exciting session. Thank you so much for today. I would like to wish everybody goodbye and namaste. See you soon. Thank you so much.